In this video, I'll give an overview of the Brielle Replica 1, a retro computer that's based on and compatible with the Apple 1. I'll discuss the history of both the Replica 1 and the Apple 1 that it emulates. We'll look at the hardware on the board, including the major components and connectors. I'll discuss the software that's included in the machine's onboard firmware, as well as additional software that it can load and run. We'll wrap things up with a summary and some references to more information. This may be the first in a series of videos with later parts covering additional hardware, software, and more advanced topics. In 1976, Steve Wozniak designed a single board computer using the MOS Technology 6502 microprocessor. It was designed for his own interest as a hobbyist, but he hoped to sell bare printed circuit boards to friends to recoup the cost of laying out the board. His friend Steve Jobs convinced local computer store The Byte Shop to buy 50 computers at $500 each, but they wanted complete systems, not bare boards. Wozniak, Jobs, and a third partner, Ron Wayne, formed Apple Computers in order to sell the Apple I to The Byte Shop and others. A total of approximately 200 Apple I machines were sold. By 1977, Wozniak had designed the more powerful and sophisticated Apple II, and existing Apple I owners were encouraged to trade in their machines for Apple II systems. The return to Apple I machines were destroyed. The number of remaining Apple I systems is currently 63, of which about six are known to be in working condition. As the first Apple product and one of the first personal computers, they're highly sought after and demand high prices at auction, one unit having sold for over 900,000 US dollars. The story of one of the Apple I systems is described in this book, The First Apple, by Bob Luther. He bought one in a storage auction and spent several years tracking down its history. His unit was sold at auction in 2014 for $365,000. The Apple I was significant in that it featured a keyboard and video output at a time when most computers were programmed in binary using front panel toggle switches. It also supported programming using the BASIC language, using a BASIC interpreter written by Wozniak himself. An optional cassette tape interface plugged into an expansion slot and allowed programs to be permanently stored and loaded. Vince Brielle is a collector of old computers who started with an Apple II, and after reading about the history of the Apple I, was intrigued by the idea of building one. While some parts, like the 6502 CPU, are still manufactured, many of the original components are no longer made, and the Apple I is a relatively complex board. Vince decided to make a compatible replica of the Apple I using more modern components. This also allowed it to support more memory, for example. He found he was able to generate video using a microcontroller and a couple of external chips, something that took 24 chips on the original Apple I. In 2003, Vince formed Brielle Computers and started selling the first revision of the Apple I replica. An article about the project in Wired magazine helped generate some publicity. He was also able to contact Steve Wozniak through a friend and got permission to use the Apple I firmware, which had been created before the forming of Apple. Brielle Computers now offers a number of products, including the Micro Kim, a replica of the MOS Technology Kim 1, an Altair 8800 replica, and an Ohio Scientific Superboard clone. All of these are offered either as kits or fully assembled. The Replica 1 has gone through a number of revisions since 2003. The first version used an AVR microcontroller for generating video and another one for the PS2 keyboard interface. A serial interface required purchasing a separate add-on board. This version is covered in this book, Apple One Replica Creation Back to the Garage by Tom Oad. The second edition integrated the previous serial I.O. board and a new USB interface onto the main board. Other improvements included using a small wall wart type DC power supply instead of the previous model's reliance on a full PC power supply and a power on indicator light. The third edition, which is the unit I own and will show in this video, was the first to use a propeller CPU chip for generating video and controlling the PS2 keyboard interface. In 2013, Vince introduced the 10th anniversary edition. It's powered by USB and includes a USB to serial adapter for the serial interface, so you don't need a serial port on the host computer. Some of the circuitry was simplified, such as having the propeller chip generate the 6502 CPU clock. 
The firmware was expanded to support two versions of BASIC, the original Apple I BASIC as well as AppleSoft Lite, a port of Apple II BASIC. It was offered in a limited edition of 50 units that had a red colored circuit board. The most recent version is the Replica One Plus, which is essentially the same as the 10th anniversary limited edition, except for the PCB color, which is back to a standard green. But enough history, let's move on to looking at the actual board and what it can do. This is the Replica One Third Edition. Let's go over the major hardware components and connectors. Power is supplied to this connector using any external supply that can provide 7 to 9 volts DC and 1 amp of current. To the left of the power jack is the on-off switch and to the right of that the power LED. You can also power the unit from a standard ATX power supply by plugging it into the ATX power connector here. If you use an accessory board that also requires minus 12 volt power like the cassette tape interface, you'll need to use an ATX power supply. This is the serial port, which is unique to the Replica One and was not present on the original Apple One. As we'll see, this is the main way the programs are transferred to and from the machine. Video comes out of this RCA connector and is in NTSC format, so you'll need a suitable monitor or television. To emulate the original Apple One, the video is monochrome with 24 lines of 40 characters. These pads are intended as a breadboard area for the user to add circuitry. The original Apple One also had a breadboard area. I've made use of this to make some modifications, which I'll describe later. Rounding up the connectors, at the bottom right is a PS2 keyboard connector. This allows using a standard PS2 type PC keyboard. The original Apple One required an external ASCII parallel interface keyboard. These are now difficult to find. If you do have one, however, you can connect it to the keyboard port here. There is one 44-pin expansion slot, which is compatible with the connector on the Apple One, as well as an edge connector with the same signals that was also present on the Apple One. The Apple One offered a cassette tape interface which plugged into the slot. Let's look at the major chips and components on the board. At the bottom left is the crystal oscillator for the 6502 CPU. Like the original Apple One, it runs at 1 MHz. I've actually replaced mine with a 2 MHz crystal as the CPU and other circuitry will work fine at this speed. As it is socketed, I can put a 1 MHz crystal back in if needed. Next to that is the 6502 CPU, the same as on the original Apple One. This is the chip that runs the Apple One software. A number of manufacturers made 6502 chips over the years. The chip I received with my kit was a new old stock Synertech chip with a 1981 date code. At the moment I have a Rockwell 65CO2 chip installed. This is a newer version of the 6502 with additional instructions. I may cover this in more detail in a future video. To the right of the 6502 is a 6821 Peripheral Interface Adapter or PIA. This was on the original Apple One and provides two 8-bit ports that communicate with the keyboard and video circuitry. The large chip at the right is the Parallax Propeller CPU. This chip produces the video output and keyboard interface and replaces 20 or so chips that were needed on the original Apple One. The propeller is a very interesting chip containing eight 32-bit CPUs that can communicate with each other. The propeller CPU could be the subject of another video all by itself. To the right of the propeller CPU is a 5 MHz crystal that generates its clock, and above that is a 32 kilobyte serial ROM that contains the firmware for the propeller CPU. On power up, the propeller loads the software from the ROM into its internal memory. A nice feature is that the ROM is electrically erasable, so its contents can be rewritten with different software by the propeller under control of a host computer through the serial port. At the far left, we have the ROM for the 6502 code, which is typically a 2764 EEPROM or 2864 EEPROM. There's 8K of ROM. The original Apple One had only 256 bytes of ROM. The larger ROM of the Replica One allows it to include more software, which we'll cover shortly. To the right of that is the RAM, a 62256 static RAM chip providing 32 kilobytes. The original Apple One only came with 4K of RAM and was expandable to 8K.
This required a total of 16 RAM chips and cost several hundred dollars at the time. In the middle of the board are some 7400 series TTL chips performing functions like address decoding, which is often called glue logic. There's a regulator IC for the 5 volt supply and one for the 3.3 volts needed by the propeller CPU. In the center of the board is the reset switch, which resets the 6502 CPU. The Apple one had a similar switch. It also had the clear screen button, which cleared the video display. This was necessary because the 6502 CPU did not directly control the video memory. The replica one implements this as well. I purchased my unit as a kit. It came with all parts and the manual covers the assembly instructions. The kit is quite easy to build for anyone with some experience soldering and identifying electronic components. If you aren't comfortable building it yourself, you can purchase an assembled unit. The included manual is on a CD and includes a schematic for the board as well as the source code and firmware for the propeller ship. The EEPROMs are also pre-programmed for you if you buy the kit version. By the way, the original Apple one was sold as an assembled and tested circuit board, but you needed to add a power supply, keyboard, and television or monitor. Some users even built cases for their systems. I mentioned that I made some modifications to my system, including the higher clock speed crystal and Rockwell 65CO2 chip. I also added the plastic standoffs that you see here. A larger modification that I have found useful is the fast serial port mod. We haven't yet talked about the serial port, but I'll mention the mod now because it's obvious in some of the demos I'll be showing. Because the 6502 in the replica is quite slow, it's not able to keep up with the serial port at speeds above about 2400 bits per second, and sometimes not even that speed when running BASIC. There's a hardware mod and changes to the propeller firmware that add hardware handshaking to the serial port so that it can run as fast as the CPU can keep up. This allows the serial port to run at up to 115 kilobits per second with no data loss. It requires adding four jumper wires and reprogramming the propeller chip. I'll provide a reference to the mod in the references at the end of the video. One minor annoyance is that the replica one, like the Apple one, has no power on reset circuit. You need to hit the reset button after power up. I added a power on reset circuit using a 555 timer chip on the breadboard area. The circuit's based on the one that Steve Wozniak implemented on the Apple II. The final mod is this large capacitor. I added it across the minus 12 volt rail to help filter the power as I was seeing a lot of noise when using an ATX power supply and this was affecting the cassette tape interface. Let's fire up the Replica 1 and see it operating. Three different programs are built into the Replica 1 firmware. The WAS monitor, BASIC, and the Crusader assembler. We'll look briefly at each. We need to hook the system up to a power supply, a composite monitor, and a PS2 keyboard. For authenticity, I'm using an old Commodore monitor from the 1980s. We power the system on and hit the reset button. The backslash and flashing ampersand indicate that we're running the WAS monitor, the small 256-byte monitor program written by Steve Wozniak, popularly known as WAS. This was the only program built into the ROMs of the original Apple One. It allows you to view and change the contents of memory and execute programs. Unless you had the optional cassette interface, the only way to load programs was to enter them by hand in the WASMON. The monitor is very simple. Typing a hex address and return will display the contents of that address. You can enter a start and end address separated by a dot and it will dump that range of memory. If you enter an address followed by a colon, you can write new data to that address in subsequent locations. Finally, the R command will start execution or run starting from an address. The original Apple One operation manual gives an example of a program to enter and run, and the Brielle computer manual uses the same example, so let's enter that. We type the start address 0, followed by a colon, and the 11 bytes that make up the program. 
When run, the program should display all of the ASCII characters from 0 to 255 and repeat forever or until we hit reset. That's really all there is to the WAS monitor. The entire source code for it was published in the Apple One manual. Small assembly language programs can be assembled by hand into machine language and the bytes entered using the WASMON, but it's very tedious and error prone. Machine language is difficult for beginning programmers. Steve Wozniak realized this and so he single-handedly wrote a BASIC language interpreter for the Apple I. BASIC is a much simpler language to program in, supporting English commands like print and go to. Apple I BASIC is 4K in size and so needs an Apple I with at least 8K of RAM. On the original Apple I, it needed to be loaded into RAM either by hand from the WASMON or loaded from cassette tape. In the Replica I, it's in ROM, so it's immediately available. Let's start it from address E000. Now let's enter a simple four-line basic program. And we can now run it with the run command. And as expected, the program displays the numbers from 1 to 1,000. Apple Basic does the job, but it has a number of quirks and limitations. Most notably, it only supports integer numbers. It's pretty well documented in the Apple Basic user's manual that comes with the Replica 1 CD. It's also slightly different from other variants of Basic, but it's able to run sizable and complex programs. I'll show some examples when we talk about how to load and save. The 8K ROM in the Replica 1 still had space left, so a third program was included, the Crusader Assembler. Crusader is an assembler which runs on the machine and allows writing code in assembly language rather than machine code. Let's look at a simple example entering the program we entered earlier into WASMON, but this time as assembly language rather than hex bytes. This is a slightly different version that displays 255 ASCII characters once and then returns. So we've started Crusader by executing address F000 from WASMON, and we get the Crusader startup prompt. So we type in just to enter a new program, and now start entering the assembly language uh, instructions for our program. We can type L to list the program and A to assemble it. And it was successful starting at the default address 300. And now we can run it with the R command specifying address 300. And as expected, it displays the character set and then returns back to Crusader. Crusader comes with an extensive manual that explains its features and operation in quite a bit of detail. Earlier I mentioned the serial port. This is a feature of the Replica 1 that was not present in the Apple 1. By connecting a computer to the serial port, you can use a terminal emulator to control the Replica 1 and transfer files to and from it. The serial port essentially mirrors everything going out to the screen and accepts input as if it was coming from the keyboard. So by sending a file from a PC, you can load it into the Replica 1 or capture output from the Replica 1 and save it to a file on the computer. To load binary data, you need to send it in the format that the WAS monitor expects. I wrote a small utility called bin to mon that converts a binary program to the WAS mon format. I typically use a 6502 assembler and C compiler called CA65 to build 6502 programs on a desktop computer, convert the binary output to WAS mon format, and then load it into the replica one. Let's look at an example. <laughs> 
The serial port needs to be connected to a desktop or laptop computer. You need to have a suitable straight through serial cable. If your computer doesn't have a serial port built in, you'll need a USB to serial adapter. I'm using one here on a laptop running Ubuntu Linux. Normally the serial port runs at 2400 bits per second, but with the high speed serial mod I mentioned earlier, I'm using 115 kilobits per second with hardware handshaking. I wrote a small program in the C programming language to play the dice game Yum, a variation of the game Yahtzee. I used the CA65 C compiler to cross compile it for the 6502 processor on a laptop and produce a Wasmon file which we can load into the Replica 1. I fired up a terminal emulator called Minicom and am now talking to the Waz monitor from it, the same as if I was using the keyboard and monitor. I can now send the program file to the Replica 1 to load it into memory. The program is quite large because it's written in the C programming language, but it takes just under 20 seconds to load and we can see it run after loading. After it loads, let's try playing a partial game. Binary programs can be saved by dumping the appropriate range of memory from the WAS monitor and capturing the output from the serial port and saving it to a file on the PC. Basic programs can be loaded in two ways. If you save them as a binary snapshot of memory, you can load them back as binaries from the WASMON. Or from basic, you can use the list command to list the program and capture the output to a file. Then from basic, sending a program to the serial port will load it back into basic. This method tends to be a little slower, but it's simpler and easier than saving and loading as binary data. As an example of a basic program, here's one that I wrote that generates an individual's horoscope reading. We go into basic from Wasmon, and then send the file out the serial port to the replica one. Now let's try loading a reasonably large basic program, a port of the famous Star Trek game, to Apple One Basic. This one was saved as a Wasmon binary and was included on the Replica One CD. I've ported or written software for the Replica 1 which is available from my GitHub account listed under References at the end of this video. I've also written a quick reference, a list of useful addresses, and some other documents on the Replica 1 that you may find useful if you have a system. I should mention again that the latest boards being shipped by Briel Computers are the Replica 1 Plus, which is slightly different from the third edition model demonstrated in this video. The history of the Apple I is a fascinating story and has been covered in a number of books and even in films. I only had time to give a brief thumbnail sketch in this video. I recently visited Disney Epcot in Orlando, Florida. The huge geodesic dome that's the centerpiece of the park is also a ride called Spaceship Earth that tells the history of human achievement.
Near the end is a scene of a scruffy bearded figure working away in a garage full of electronics with a primitive computer. It looked just like Waz and the Apple One, right down to the slowly scrolling display on a television set. I have seen a real Apple One at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. For most of us, a real Apple One is out of our price range. The week before I recorded this, a unit sold on eBay for $236,000. There are other Apple One replicas like the Mimeo by Mike Willigal, which is an almost exact replica of the original Apple One circuit board. A number of people have built replicas using the Mimeo board and painstakingly acquired all the necessary parts, sometimes with the correct manufacturer and date codes as an original Apple One. For free, there are Apple One emulators like the Palm One. It was recently ported to run on Android devices. It's quite cool to see Apple One code running on a phone. It's also quite shocking to see how much computer power is improved. My phone has at least a thousand times the computing power and resources of the Apple One. There are more things that can be done with the Replica One. In future, I may show the Apple cassette interface, the Brielle Multi-IO board, and the CFFA1 compact flash card. There's also more software, including other versions of BASIC, like a port of AppleSoft from the Apple II. I may even show the Replica 1 running a 16-bit 65816 processor.